Good morning, everyone. This is Lori DeToro from Fluke Excelix. Thank you for joining us for this month's best practice webinar. As software and sensor producers, we offer an array of webinars and other education, including product demos and product training. Our best practice webinar series focuses not on our technology and software, but on maintenance strategies and solutions with speakers from a variety of backgrounds to share their knowledge. We are really pleased today to have with us John Burnett and Frederick Baldar, two experts from Fluke, who will be answering your questions about starting and growing a condition monitoring program. Good morning, John and Frederick. Thanks so much for joining us today. Good morning. Good morning. Um, before you get started with your presentation, um, I know I always come to you when I need questions answered when I'm writing pieces of content because you are both so knowledgeable. Can you tell us why you're so passionate about helping folks improve their maintenance and reliability programs? Yeah, sure. So um, I guess a lot of it is just because um, I've been doing it for years and years. So started out as being a um, a maintenance person in the Navy, where I uh, I learned about uh, the the benefits and and how reliability and condition monitoring could help make the plant uh, run much better and keep the plant up and running. And so over the years, I've worked closely with customers, uh, first uh, other Navy uh, customers, and then other customers around the world, and now working with Fluke. And so. Um, it just feels really good working with people and helping them find solutions that make their job easier and help them uh, keep their plant running. Lori, I think for me it's, it has to do with um, what, what I tend to call cradle to grave. So I like to see the process from beginning to end um, and the challenge to help the customers um, and including even our own. Um, internal people from the beginning where they potentially have no way, don't know where or how to start and walk them through the whole process. And we did this even with our own factory here, which uh, we still continue it. And the, the good thing is that it's not a one week or two week or even one month. It's a whole process that sometimes can take months, if not years. And so seeing this growing over time, that's really, really what appeals the most to me. Thanks so much, Frederick and John. I appreciate you answering that. Um, we'll get started in just a minute. First, we have some housekeeping, housekeeping items to go over. So today's webinar is being recorded. Um, phone lines will be muted to minimize background noise, but this is a Q&A based webinar. So please type in your questions about condition monitoring, any of the technologies that you're interested in. And as we go through the slides, we will be um, asking those live. We're not gonna wait all the way to the end to ask those questions. So please get your questions in whenever you think of them. Um, you can use the question feature on GoToWebinar to submit them, like I said, anytime. And, um, and I'll read them to um, Frederick and John as we go. Uh, if you'd like to receive the slides from today's presentation, please let us know during the survey that will appear at the end of the session and, the, and we'll send that to you. And the recorded webinar will be available on excelix.com slash community. Um, I think that's it for our background and housekeeping items. Frederick, let's get started with you telling us a little bit more about uh, your expertise. Sure. So I'm Frederick Boda. I'm the lead application specialist for uh, for the Fluid Digital System business. Um, and so I've been with the company uh, close to four years now. And previously I worked at uh, uh, G Oil and Gas for 15 years, doing a number of roles, a um, lot of uh, in the field, um, with uh, with a numbers of uh, service and product uh, uh, solutions and capability. Um, and really also, I started um, doing some more reliability work as I was finishing my career with, towards the end of my career with GE. So um, this is really the, the heavy focus that we have and I have within the organization. Um, and um, we try to, to, as a business, we try to educate all the specialists to really be the almost a mini MacGyver of all the technology if you wanted to. So this is why myself and my team are going through a CMRP certification, having different level 
of technology uh, needed to make sure that we can help our customers. And it's not just about uh, the sale of a tool. It's really about the education as much as the, the, the product itself. Great, thanks, Frederick. And John, tell us a little bit about yourself too, please. Sure, so um, as I've mentioned before, I started uh, my career uh, some 30 years ago in the US Navy, and uh, I watched the Navy go from run to failure maintenance to plan maintenance to um, um, predictive and condition-based maintenance. And uh, since then, I've been working with uh, a vibration consulting company for 18 years where we help build reliability programs. And then I've been with Fluke for seven years. And uh, at, uh, at Fluke, I've uh, worked to uh, help uh, Fluke customers as they uh, work, uh, you know, they, they get down the, the, uh, their, the path to, re to reliability. Thanks, John. Awesome, we will get to our first and most basic question. Um, what is condition monitoring and then how do you get started? So we put the definition right here of the condition monitor, which I'll let you read on it. But I think then what I really want to focus on is it. So why are we doing this uh, or why anyone is doing this? How do you how actually you start the process and what are some of the important steps? Um, I think then um, these two questions kind of go hand in hand, at least for, for me. Um, how do we uh, explain to the customer where to start the process and the, the first step? It really is almost um, a way of putting your hands over your head and looking what's, what's under it. What I mean by this is that it's really looking at um, what are we doing correctly, what are we not doing, and uh, what asset um, needs to be taken care of it. Um, often, we explain to customers then you want to start a program, um, regardless of the type of technology you use, but you want to start a program fairly uh, small and grow in, in order to build this. Um, often, it also includes, one of the first steps would include is, let's look at all the assets that we have in our facility or in the, the process environment that we have, and what are really the assets that we need to take care of it. And what I mean by this is not what you have been doing, but what you can do, and it's both ways. And so we can give example as we're going through, but it's really about are we doing things the right way? Is it productive? Are we spending way too much time on certain assets that we should be? Are we buying assets uh, repetitively because we're always in a reactive mode? So there's various ways to look at this, and there's no one formula that would work because every customer, every facility is completely different. But you have to find a, a way, a system that works for you and also, uh, the thing that we don't talk enough about that goes about the process and the, the first few steps, it's also about a culture and change. And I think then um, the cultural change, cultural uh, change is a big important impact on how we actually going to do things. Yeah, that's that's great. If I uh, if if I can add, uh, remember that that. You know, condition monitoring or reliability um, is a is a is a journey. It's not a destination. And the one thing that I've learned over the years is that um, just getting a bunch of numbers, just doing a bunch of trending, isn't the solution. Isn't the answer because what quickly happens is now you've got a bunch of numbers that nobody knows what to do with. So. Number one is we've got to get answers from those numbers because we just don't have the time to look at complex graphs and we got to keep a plant running. So we need to get answers that, and that's what condition monitoring is really all about, and that is looking for change. I'm not, I don't care so much as what are all the numbers coming in. I want to know what is the change. And so absolute value of the number means nothing. But the change is an indication of some fault condition. And that's where 
It's a signal or an alarm to me to say, I need to go look at this machine. This machine is telling me that something isn't isn't right. And the and so the second and the other part of that is we never ever get to a point where we're we're actually complete. So what I mean by that is um if if you over time you build up your liability program and and you see all these great improvements, don't ever let your guard down because I've seen time and time again of companies that get successes, they build their program up, and then they don't document the saves. They don't write down what successes they have. And then in three, two, three years, when a new CEO comes in and they say, what's this reliability or condition monitoring group doing? I see they're, they're costing us X amount of money. What are they saving us? And it's all about what have you done for me lately? So you need to make sure that you have good goals at the beginning, you get good answers, but also as this progresses, make sure you capture the information because that way when somebody says, why do we have a condition monitoring or reliability program? We can say, because it saved us this much money and we have to be able to show them that. Thanks, John and Frederick. Um, while you were answering this question, um, another question came in that I think lends itself to how do you get started? And it is, um, how do you get a proper baseline on equipment that has been running for years and may have underlying problems? Yeah, that's that's kind of what I was alluding to before. Um, a lot of people have this uh, uh, idea that hey, this is great because now I can collect data and um, I can start trending this over time. And then when it increases, um, I, uh, I know that I've got a problem. Well, it's not quite that easy because there's a couple of things to think about. Number one, um, you know, do you know what bad is for this machine? Are you a vibration expert? Do you know, uh, you know, is a little bit over the baseline a problem is a lot over the problem. So unless you're willing to spend the next months looking at a machine and tracking that information and waiting until a fault occurs, um, there's a lot of work to that. So that's why earlier I talked about it's not so much about the number or even a change in that number. It's what is good or bad. So we need to have some type of a standard or some type of, of a database that tells us what's good or and what is bad. Because the second problem with that is, what if my machine is already in a fault condition? And so if I select, if I start at a point where my machine's already in a fault condition and I see a slight increase, that might be an increase as that machine went from extreme to very extreme or it might have been that machine went from good to a little bit of a problem. So without knowing what the condition of your machine is when you start, you know, how do you select that as your baseline? So there's a lot more to just selecting a baseline and just taking off and running. Frederick, any? Yeah, that, that, that's exactly right, John. And I think that what I have also a thing about when we talk about baseline and underlying problem with the current uh, aspect is that um, sometimes we're actually looking at issue that seems to be uh, visible in front of us or potentially visible in front of us with an asset when in reality there is quite a few factors outside of that asset can actually be the cause of the issue which would not give you a good baseline. And I'll take an example, a very simple one where I had a customer who had a series of compressors. Um, I think two of them were 50 horsepower, one was 25 horsepower, in order to maintain a compressed air in a factory, in a production factory. And um, I remember for, for weeks, if not months, they were looking at the compressor uh, potential issues, and they were measuring the compressor, um, they were measuring the thermal imaging, they were capturing also some vibration data, some electrical, so they were doing the right thing in terms of combination of the technology. Um, but one thing they kept forgetting about doing is looking at the external um, um, 
component, they would actually affect the compressor on itself, thinking that it was only the compressor. Come to find out then uh, a few of those components were actually failing on a regular basis. Uh, there were random failures, but they were affecting the compressors. And so right there, even if you try to establish a baseline, um, depending on the number of years you have this asset, uh, the problem was not necessarily the compressor on itself, which could give you or not a good baseline. It was really what was, uh, what was around. And so what I've learned early on when I was doing field service is really looking at the, the entire um, process Then you have either forward or downstream, um, upstream or downstream of, of that asset. And I think it's important in order to be able to have the best data at the best baseline that you can set up. So, Frederick, basically in that example, you needed to look at the whole system versus just the one asset that was failing because that the asset wasn't the real problem, right? Yeah, and yes, that's exactly right. And so what some of the recommendation that we did was, um, hey, let's continue to monitor the compressor, but we really want to make sure that we put a list of all the, the failure that you had that has affected these two, three compressors. Um, let's remove those failures, see if they are very similar, uh, if they are different, what is really affecting the, the, the use of the, uh, of the compressor over time. Um, in order to eliminate this issue, in order to truly establish what good looks like. Because that was the problem is that they, wa they wanted to establish a good baseline, but with the number of failure, especially over the summer, they were, able, they were unable to actually do that. And so as we tried to remove some of those, some of those uh, external component failure, then we slowly start to gather more and more data, which allow us to actually have a good baseline. Great, thank you so much. Let's move to our next question, which is what are the technologies that are available to begin a condition monitoring program? Well, that's a million dollar question, isn't it? Yeah, it is, that is. Well, there are, and, and so if we kind of look at this slide, what we're looking at here is really what we call the, the the big five you know because for years uh, we've been using these technologies for condition monitoring and you can see that um, this slide is is really geared towards um, mechanical faults so keep in mind we really would have and, and this chart that we're showing you here is a conceptual chart and so even though we have time across the bottom, there are no numbers down there. So when we look at condition monitoring, what this conceptual chart is showing you, and we call this a potential failure curve. And so what this curve is showing us is that as you go from left to right, over on the right, when you have complete failure of a machine, uh, before the machine fails, you get audible noise, and then it's hot to the touch. And so what the idea, uh, what we're showing you here conceptually, is that we can use these five technologies, oil analysis, ultrasound, vibration analysis, motor testing, and thermography, to help us look for condition changes in our machine that would help us to determine it's time to fix it. So if we're looking at the mechanical faults of a machine, then oil analysis would be the earliest indicator of a problem. So the idea here is the sooner we can find a problem, the better. And it used to be years ago that the, the, game, the, the, the game would be run a machine and get as much life out of it before you have to shut that machine down and fix it. But as you can see, as we get a machine, when it moves from, you know, oil analysis gave us an indication, then ultrasound gave us an indication, vibration, then motor testing, and then thermography, as you get closer and closer to that potential failure, um, there's a couple of things that we need to think about. One is energy waste. And so just letting a machine go until it fails might make might seem like it makes sense, but the problem is if you let it get 
down this potential failure curve into the yellow or into the orange, then the machine is wasting energy, uh, which you see is kind of a linear uh, increase, but the cost to repair is exponential, which means that if you start letting some damage happen to your bearings, if we wait until just before this machine fails to fix it, it's starting to do damage to our shaft and other components. So that's really what this is showing you is kind of the conceptual relationship of why sometimes using thermography for mechanical faults uh, might be a little late. So if you think about just bearings, for example, when we start seeing a hot bearing using thermography, it's, it's more advanced. It's too far down. The, you know, the damage is already done. And ultrasound may be a little too early. Ultrasound is going to find it too early where we still have plenty of life to that machine, where vibration analysis is going to find a fault with a bearing months in advance and allow us to make a good decision on when to take that machine down. So what I gave you was an, ex was an example of a, of a mechanical fault where vibration is kind of the Goldilocks. There are other applications like looking for motor faults where we might have a different curve that would show the therm that might show thermography and motor testing as a predominant test, not just your vibration. Uh, so, um, it, so it's really using the right technology in the right application, looking for the right faults. Frederick and Dad. Um, no, well, the only thing that I would that I would add to that, John, is that then uh, when you look at technology and for condition monitoring, there's a number, obviously, of company and technology you can have uh, more than you can imagine on the market. Uh, I also think that when you um, select a technology based on the availability, you want to have a comfort zone. So what I mean by this is that. Some customer may be more comfortable starting with vibration because they have previous experience. Some may be more comfortable to start with all analysis or ther thermography. And I think that as you build a program, um, small and then eventually big, then you want to feel comfortable about the, the technology on itself, but also the skills then your technician engineering team has and the experience that it has around a certain technology. Um, I think then one of the biggest things that John and John and I will mention this today is you if you start too big and you want to start with three or four technology because we have to get a program off the ground, if you do this, there's a good chance then first of all it's going to take a lot of resource, a lot of time, and it may not be as successful as you try to. It may be very costly as well. So it's really how comfortable you feel with one or multiple technology and the training that your team has. Thanks, Frederick. I'm going to move to this next question, and then we have another live question that I'll ask after this one. Um, so when you're implementing, um, if you're thinking about condition monitoring, what are the main benefits that you get from it? The main benefits? Um, I think for me, the, the main benefit, at least for condition monitoring, one of the aspects, regardless of the technology you use, um, recently, well, for, for the last few years, there's a really big emphasis on the wireless capability. So the, uh, for me, it's the access of the data, um, just about any, anyone from anywhere. Um, so you could have had, you could monitor a simple motor or a very expensive um, compressor, um, but the accessibility of the data by either yourself, uh, somebody on your team, or in the organization, and the ability to share the data is one of the key benefits. Um, why I think it's a benefit? Because it allows technician, engineer, or professionals to not only look at, look at the data almost on, on, a, on instantaneously, but most important is based on the data uh, they, they get, um, to actually take the right decision right there. 
And I think that that goes, that goes a long way is while we hear from our customer, or at least I do hear from my customers say, well, I never know if there's a problem with that particular asset. And when I know, it's too late. So if I have some eyes and ears, um, then, um, then I know it's been monitored, even if I don't look at the data every day. But if I know there's an issue or there's a change in condition, and then wirelessly I'm notified, for example, having an alarm, then at that point I can make the decision right there and then to either start a work order for my team, uh, making sure somebody is in the facility, go check myself, or have our team proactively do something before we lo potentially lose that asset. So the availability of the data, I think, has a real benefit on a real-time basis. Yeah, and for me, if I, uh, uh, I, I think I'd like to just kind of step back. When you think about the, the main benefits of condition monitoring, um, uh, and that is to get away from um, reacting to failures. Um, so um, when I was in the Navy and a lot of plants and, and uh, customers still are in a reactive mode, and uh, the problem with being in a reactive mode or doing PMs even is that the plant is controlling uh, uh, us instead of us controlling the plant. And what I mean by that is, you know, uh, we're just running around and, and fixing problems as they, as they pop up and we never really get into a proactive or a, or a planning or a scheduling role. So I think the main benefit of condition monitoring is knowing the condition of our machine and the ability to plan repairs in advance before the machine fails, before catastrophic failure, and to try to get control back of the plant so that, uh, so for example, a lot of the customers that I've worked with over the years, when they go from um, reactive to planned maintenance to condition monitoring, they're no longer having to um, run around the plant with a couple of fire extinguishers strapped to their sides. Now they know which machines have problems. They can plan the repairs in advance, and they, they now can fix it on their own time, not when, uh, when, everybody, when the plant is down. Awesome. Thank you both. I think what John, you just said answers this next question, but I want to pose it because evidently there is a notion out there that condition monitoring promotes reactive maintenance rather than proactive maintenance. I'm assuming you both disagree with that premise. Yeah, yeah. I, I would say that condition monitoring is very proactive um, and um, you know, I wouldn't say that it's that it's reactive at all because kind of like what I explained um, is that, um, you know, we're able to know in advance and we're able to proactively, if we know the condition of our machines, we then have better information and we can now make plans to fix it either uh, before it fails or even better yet, we can... Uh, just because a machine hasn't failed doesn't mean that functionally it isn't performing at its peak. And so that's one thing that we're starting to address nowadays is that, um, you know, it isn't so much a complete failure, it's a functional failure. So even if a machine is running at reduced capabilities, it may be time to do a repair on that machine because it's using more energy um, and it's causing uh, more load and it's wearing the, the parts out. So um, I think that condition monitoring is going to help us to be more proactive. Frederick? Yeah, I know. I agree completely. Um, I think then uh, it does not promote reactive maintenance. Well, I think it really has the focus on, maintenance, on proactive maintenance. Um, the ability to know the data um, I would say in advance of a potential failures goes into a potential proactive, not predictive, but proactive maintenance. Um, that being said, obviously condition monitoring, when you have the data at the palm of your hands or at the computer easily, 
gives you the ability to react, but it is not uh, a reactive maintenance per se. Um, reactive maintenance per se is often where you do not have any data and suddenly you have an asset to fail, you have a system to fail, and you're completely in reactive mode uh, because you have not put in place um, either sensor capability to looking at it and you just say, we're just going to let it run to fail. Now, that being said, um, there is also the notion then, uh, should we have a mixed type of methods uh, within, within an organization, within a program? And the answer is absolutely yes, you should. Not every single asset should have um, uh, sensors, uh, in, either in terms of cost, in terms of, of, uh, of uh, use. Um, and so having the ability to differentiate between what asset needs what type of maintenance is very important. You know, a $500 motor um, may or may not be as important as a $10,000 motor, but on the other hand, if it's $500, because it's easy accessible, um, easy in terms of procurement, you can have it on the shelf. The, uh, the, the program or the person responsible for the program may actually decide to let the motor run to fail and then replace it because it does not have a huge impact. And it goes back to really at the beginning where we said, um, and we mentioned about what are some of the key steps to start. It really is about asset criticality. And that will really help you really to determine which asset is critical, where does it go, and how do I actually build my program around it. Awesome, thank you. I'm gonna move to our next question. I've heard people mention with new technologies, you should start with a pilot program. Why is that? Yeah, so there's, there's two reasons for this. Um, one reason is that um, the biggest thing that I've seen over the years that have caused programs to fail is starting too big. So uh, Frederick had already mentioned this, that starting small and growing is the best way to have a successful and sustainable program. The problem with starting with all 5,000 machines in your plant is that it's going to take months to get it implemented, and by the time you've got it even 20% implemented is when the man, the big manager is going to come and say, hey, how's that program coming? And if you haven't shown some success, that program is going to be killed because it isn't being successful. So the first reason why you want to start with a pilot program is the way to show success is to start small with a small group of machines, show some success, that way, within a month or two, you have success, you can get buy-in, you can get support, you can get more budget, and you can grow the program, and it can be successful. The second reason is a lot of people want to justify the cost of the program, and it's hard to get cost justification because we can't just go on the Internet and find out what is the cost savings by condition monitoring by industry. That's because of competitive concerns and security concerns. Customers are just not willing to share the information because their competition could find out. And so a way to, to find out, to justify the program, would the easiest solution is just to do a pilot program. Because if you do a pilot program, it allows you to start on a few of your machines, show success, show some cost savings, and that's going to then be able to let you get some buy-in and get some budget to be able to grow this into other areas. It also allows you to step your foot into the water and find out which machines are good applications, because you may find out that once you get a pilot program started, you realize that, oh my goodness, what about those uh, machines over there? What are those machines in this other area? All of a sudden you realize that this program could grow to the whole plant. And so the best way to do that is to start with a pilot program. I agree. You said well. <laughs> I mean, you okay, awesome. thanks. <laughs> All right. Um, this is a little off topic, but it just came in from one of our um, 
from one of our attendees, so I want to ask it. Are the components used for wireless connectivity rated for various area classifications, such as class one, division one? I think it really depends on the, the manufacturer. Um, I think some manufacturers absolutely offer class one, div one, or petrochemical and uh, maybe offshore platform type of uh, 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 measurement. Um, I, I honestly think it, two things. It depends on the manufacturer and it depends on the type of technology uh, they use. Um, I think you will find then um, more and more from a vibration standpoint, um, the, uh, the manufacturer in general, regardless of who it is, are actually working towards that because there's a very high emphasis on vibration measurement um, these past few years. And so more and more customers, including in um, really corrosive or dangerous area, would want to measure vibration. Um, and so even so, they may not have all um, area classification, they're working towards that. Um, and that includes even um, uh, Fluke, who is um, um, doing this on some of the some of the sensors that we currently have. Um, our classification is um, really is not come down on the technology itself. It really comes down on the certification and the cost of certification and the time that it takes also. And so I think that's often the barrier that we have to go through. Um, on top of that, we're looking at since we. We, as an example, are a global company. Uh, certification in the U.S. versus Europe or Asia is quite different. And so if we're going to sell this um, um, within the Americas or even globally, we have to be aware of that as well. So the answer is yes, depending on the manufacturer and depending on the type of measurements. The one thing that, if I can add, uh, the one thing that I've learned over the years of doing this for the past 25, 30 years is that, like uh, Frederick said, uh, it's not that w uh, the technology isn't there and it's not that we don't want to have the certification. It's that it costs additional money. And to do that certification would then raise the price of the product, which do you then have to share that, that increased cost with customers that don't need the certification. So the idea would be, you know, if we, if, if this, uh, having the certification raises the price of the product 50% or makes it less capable, um, you know, there's a lot of customers that are saying, why am I having to pay for this certification when I don't need it? And uh, it's reduced the capabilities of my of my uh, machine. So so it's a balancing act. It's a we we would love that. So so the answer is the pr probably not yet. But as we get into markets that require this certification, I think it's going to be added. But if you look at some of the sensors that we're starting with, we want to start with economical solutions to a majority of machines. And that means that if we want to make it economical, we probably, our first sensors aren't going to be certified because that's going to raise the price and we don't want to raise the price on all of our sensors. So um, let's, so I think it's a work in progress. Great, thank you all both for that answer. Let's move to our next slide. And this question that came in, my plant is slowly moving into preventive routes and using handheld tools. Is it too early for us to start using condition monitoring? Um, absolutely not. So um, this is one of the, the, the challenges that, that I've ran into uh, over the years working with customers in all industries and all applications. And this applies to, um, you know, uh, you know er everybody. And, and that is, everybody is going to say, I see the benefits of condition monitoring. Uh, I see the, the benefits of of being able to trend my machines over time and knowing the condition, but I'm already 100% busy 
with my PMs and my corrections and all of that, how can I ever get ahead uh, of this? You know, if you're already in a firefighter mode, then how do you find the time to start being more proactive? And that's that's the challenge. And so that brings us back to the idea of what we talked about earlier, and that is start with a start small and grow. Start with a pilot program. So the way to be successful would be not to just all of a sudden say, okay, we're going to now in the next uh, year, we're going to move uh, all of our machines over to a condition-based maintenance and, you know, it's such a huge task, it never happens. So what we say is start with a few machines, get some successes, and then you'll start finding out a couple of things. One is some of the PMs that you're doing may be unnecessary. So if I can reduce the number of PMs because my condition monitoring is telling me that I don't need that PM, I've saved myself some time. Number two, if I start fixing machines before they fail, I get more time and resources as well. So if we can start with a small group of machines and get us some more time and resources, we can then invest that time and resources in another group of machines. So like we said earlier, start small and, uh, and grow, and that way you can start transitioning from corrective and PMs to condition monitoring. I agree. I mean, this is really how, how even our own company started on the on the journey of uh, wireless condition monitoring is because we had already handheld tools um, to do preventive maintenance. Um, and so the idea was, hey, why don't we try to also help our customer to have a selection because during preventing routes, they may actually find uh, issue with an asset, they need to be monitored 24-7 uh, for a long time in order to identify, hey, do I truly have an issue with this machine and how can I prove uh, by collecting some of the data? Uh, so I don't think it's ever too early. And it has to be about a comfort level as well. Um, and it's not about, there's no need to force this upon two people. They have to feel comfortable, first of all, about using handheld. But it really, it, it's, it should be complement each other. So you doing preventive maintenance with the handheld tools, as well as having some condition monitoring um, on a few machines could be very beneficial. Um, again, it's all about having some of the data as your, your eyes and ears away from a certain asset, especially if that asset is tend to be critical for part of the process. So I don't think so. Okay, great, thank you. Let's go to our next question. Um, how should I select a technology to start a condition monitoring program? Well, I think we kind of talked about that already. When, when in the first slide, when, when we showed that potential failure curve and we talked about um, you know, using vibration to look at some of the mechanical faults, that was kind of the Goldilocks. But a little bit more than that, is, and so so the, the the real answer to this, I believe, is what are your expected failure modes? So you want to match your technology to the expected failure mode. So that means if you're getting a lot of mechanical failures, bearings and mo and and bear, uh, you know bearings and seals and imbalance and misalignment then that means that you're probably going to want to look at vibration analysis. If you're getting a lot of motor faults, if you're getting a lot of overheated motors, a lot of trip breakers, um, a lot of um, you know insulation breakdown, a lot of motor winding problems, then we're probably going to want to look at some more of the electrical type tools. Um, if some of your, uh, and well, in addition, thermal tools because Thermal uh, thermography is good for looking for, you know, uh, uh, fuses that have problems, wires that have overloads, tank levels, processes. So I think the, the real answer there is to look at your problems. You know, what, do, what things do, do, do you see that you need to fix that will help you find the technology that you should uh, be looking at? 
the uh, okay. the thing that I didn't mention about this, and along with what John mentioned, is um, we have had quite a few customers who have approached us and say we have a third party uh, company that comes to our facility to do vibration, thermals, and others, and so um, um, and they do um, like a yearly review of all the assets and then provide reports. So um, it can also be uh, selecting a technology to start a condition marine program can be a cost saving, meaning then if that third party company, if that, even if they have done a great job, you may actually decide that then you want to bring this in house. And so instead of paying 10, 15, 20 thousand dollars, whatever the amount is, you may have a, a brand new technician or reliability engineer who just got on staff, and uh, the recommendation may be hey, you know what, if we do a small investment, we can actually have that technology um, on a daily basis here, and we can be almost in control of our own data. Um, and we can do as fun and as left, because one of the issues, obviously, with the third-party company is that they come once or twice a year, they provide recommendation on change that needs to be made based on the data collected, um, but then after that, if you don't have that technology, how do you find out that the work that you perform has been has been done properly? So that's one of the the aspects that you can look at it from a, from a cost saving as well. Great. Um, a question related to um, technology types: um, Are the instruments you've discussed today hardwired or are they wireless? Or I think they can be both, right? Yes, yeah, so for years, um, the wired sensors have been the, uh, the, the technology of choice, mainly because the wireless um, sensors, the technology wasn't really there yet to make it cost effective. And so, um, so, so the answer is both right now but for years, it was just wired because the wireless technology wasn't there. Now we're starting to see both. And so it really depends on the application and the need. There are still going to be some applications where you're going to want to have it wired, you know. There are going to be other applications where wireless is going to be good because of a uh, remote, because it's behind a panel access you can't get to. And so I think we're going to have a little bit of both, um, depending on the application, the need. Uh, the other thing is the amount of data. You know, if you want true continuous monitoring and you've got a lot of data that you've got to push to from the sensor to the program, then you might not be able to get it through a wireless and we might have to use wired. So I think we're... The good news is the wireless technology is now getting good enough that we can start seeing both. Great. Frodo, did you have anything to add to that? Nope. I'm good. Awesome. Um, the next question we have, again, about technology is what kind of voltage monitors do you, I'm assuming fluke, but y'all can also talk in generalities if you'd like to, are available for condition monitoring for voltage. I'll let you. So for, condi for condition monitoring, um, at least from what I know that, that we provide, and I'm sure other manufacturers provide others, is that um, um, there's two types. There's number one, um, the single sensors with uh, sim simple gateways, um, I think it goes all the way up to um, 600 volts um, AC and DC. So it is AC and DC sensors uh, wirelessly with a gateway. That's number one. And the other one is really a, a power monitoring, um, the 3540 um, system, which is it's a logging capability also uh, with the capability to monitoring, uh, three-phase power monitoring, uh, I think up to uh, 500 or 600 volts. Those are the two common ones. I know on the market there's other ones who are wireless um, and may have um, similar or additional capability. 
but this is how we as a business wanted to start with these ones. Thanks, Frederick. And we can provide, and I was going to say, we can provide some information at the end. So when we when we um, post the uh, um, the presentation, we'll provide um, the uh, spec sheet or information that are related to the voltage uh, monitor. That's perfect. Thank you. This question is a little more involved, and I give you my permission to um, say we'll answer it later if you need to, but um, this is a facility manager who has settings outside of manufacturing. I have to make the business case to network critical machines at multiple distant locations. Could you point out any case studies involving diverse and remote facilities with just a few machines per location? Yeah, we're going to have to work a little bit on that because yeah. the the problem that we run into is getting uh, getting customers to share that information with us because in today's competitive security uh, sensitive environment, companies are just not willing to share that information with us. And although we would love to be able to have that information. Um, so we can give some general examples and we can help them a little bit with answering those questions. But unfortunately, uh, you know, it's hard to get specific case studies and information on specific uses, specific uh, applications, specific industries, uh, because um, we just can't get people to give us that information. I would uh, I would extend to this is that um, we'll do a little research on it, but I think that we have presented at least one that I know was the automotive manufacturing where we work closely with them on starting um, a pilot program, and they've been doing this for over six months now. Have been collected the data, and the data even actually uh, being integrated to their own CMMS, um, and the idea behind it is that. They would um, they were monitoring multiple um, multiple part of the facility, um, so they have different lines, and they would wanted to try to find out and establish a baseline on each of those. I think it was motors, it was electrical. There was a series of uh, measurements they were capturing in order to establish the baseline for each of those aspects, and also figure it out um, where potentially could the problem be. All that with all the data uh, flowing directly into the CMMS. So if any alarms would uh, would be triggered, it would create a work order. So that's the case that we've been working on it, and we I think we can actually share that case because we have been reading on it. But I will um, I will work closely with Laurie um, and make sure that we are able to share that. And if we are, I will we can easily provide this. Uh, but I agree with John. And one of the hardest things is as we're working with some of our customers is um, they, they share a lot of information, but that doesn't mean it can be public as a true case study. I think then later on this year and, and in 2019, we're going to see more and more customers as we dive into uh, condition monitoring um, deeper, especially on the wireless, where customers will be willing to actually provide some of these information. Um, and so... Um, um, we should see a lot more case studies in, in my guess, in the next six to 12 months. Great. Thanks so much. Um, another question going back to the voltage monitoring. Would voltage monitoring equipment have time stamps to allow us to correlate voltage anomalies to other types of failures? So the, the simple answer is yes. So when you look at the training capability, um, if it doesn't, then and I would never consider even trying to look at it or put it on the market if I was a manufacturer. But if I take our own example, yes, you will have the training with the date, the time stamp, the alarm, the type of alarms where you can correlate when um, an issue arises or when a changing condition arises. If there is an issue arise, then you can correlate between, between phases if you need to. Or if you need to look at uh, different um, different type of technology. So, for example, you have a three-phase monitoring, and you're measuring the three-phase on the motor, and you also want to look at the vibration. The ability to have a timestamp allows you to to kind of superimpose 
the data between the vibration to make sure are we looking at an increase in vibration or are we looking on the electrical issues? And so um, uh, absolutely for all the measurements at least that we provide, and I think then it goes without saying then other manufacturers do the same, but yes, we, we do have that. Awesome, thank you so much. I'm gonna move to our next slide. Um, can you tell us about some training opportunities or trainers who you, who you would recommend? Yes, so as I mentioned at the beginning, one of the key components of what we're trying to do, at least at Fluke, is not just about the, the, the product or the solution. Uh, for me, the solution goes along with a lot of educational. So we work a lot of closely with uh, um, a series of university uh, trading schools. I think that's a key component. Uh, but also, it's all about the education on the customer. So I, I would never want for us to sell any kind of product without a good explanation um, and tell the customers. My first question to them is really, what are you going to do with the data? If you get this wireless sensor, the handheld, what are you looking at that? Why are you doing it with it? Um, and what action from the data are you going to take? And I think that's really the key things right here. So the big component for all the product specialists, all the specialists within the organization is really about training opportunities. That means that we work closely with our training organization to build content that can be provided to customers in, in form of either a, a technical book, in form of a live uh, training, uh, pay one pay, um, and for some of the uh, training that we cannot yet offer, we work closely with other organizations such as, you know, Mobius for, for vibration, Aerodicio for condition monitoring, asset uh, monitoring, reliability in general. There's a number, Snell for thermography training. There's a number of uh, um, partnership that, that we have that we work closely together because at the end of the day, I'm hoping that when you work in reliability, you're almost seeing this as a big family. We want, really want to help each other. And so for us, it's really, really key. And I say this internally to my own team, it's all about how you provide the data and the training to the customers. That is really the key thing. Would you, would you agree, John? Yes, yes. And, and uh, that was great. And also to uh, also add, um, a lot of the training um, Fluke uh, can offer as well. Uh, so, for example, with our vibration tester, um, we have a complete self-paced training program that we've spent uh, a lot of time and energy and resources to develop a uh, a, tr a self paced training program with videos and exercises that the customer can train themselves. And it's not just in how to use the tool, but it's also the basics of vibration analysis, the basics of how to start up a condition monitoring program, uh, the basics of, uh, you know, how to be successful uh, with, uh, with other things. So, so we have a lot of uh, uh, training materials available as well that uh, are self-paced. Thank you both. Let's move to the next question. Can data from sensors be integrated into a CMS, CMMS or an EAM? Yes, and that's, uh, I think that's the big things. Uh, then um, a lot of organizations, including ours, are working on it. It's, um, it's one thing to provide the sensor and the data, but what are you truly doing with it and where is it going? Um, there's no question you can have data overload. I mean, we have this, I hear this all the time with customers. I have no clue what to do with the data or we have the sensor or we have this, but we never looked at it. Um, and one of the aspects that is that we see more and more customers in the maintenance and reliability world um, getting involved, if they're not already, with a true CMMS. Uh, or with the, with the EAM, which should be part of any condition monitoring program in order to collect the data and really have a centralized location where the data goes, both from uh, managing the data, but also could be ordering parts, could be um, asset 
uh, tracking. There's a number of things that can be done with this. Um, obviously, work orders, creation, and a number of uh, aspects along with that. Um, the big thing is that we're working on is, is obviously the uh, data, where the data is going. And so having the ability to integrate the data coming from either handheld tools or wireless sensor um, into various CMMS, EAM, ERP is a key component. And it's probably going to be a really big differential for multiple companies to be able to offer this to their customers. So the answer is absolutely and yes. All the way. Awesome. We have ended. We are, we are at the end of our time. So I want to thank everyone for joining us. Um, we um, will have the video um, up live, the recorded video up live on excelx.com slash community. John and Frederick, thank you. And um, we hope you all enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you.